what my prayer has been and was from the very beginning in my marriage and in my family uh, is, God, I want more than anything for my, my wife to be able to stand and my children to be able to stand and say, albeit very imperfectly, that man was determined to love God and love us. Welcome to the Jesus Calling Podcast. Our guests are a pair of father-daughter duos who have enjoyed a close relationship in the various seasons of their family's lives and discuss the impact of fatherhood and being fathered. Christian singer-songwriter Stephen Curtis Chapman and his daughter Emily Chapman Richards, and country music artist and Christian music producer Mark Miller and his daughter Madison Brown. As Stephen Curtis Chapman grew up in Paducah, Kentucky, he fell in love with the way his father not only expressed himself through music, but also the way he expressed his deep love for God. Stephen worked hard to carry these lessons into his own family. Today, he and his daughter, Emily, tell us what it was like growing up in the Chapman house and how, as a child, Emily led the family to become the ardent supporters of adoption they are today. I'm Stephen Curtis Chapman. I am a singer-songwriter People probably most know if they recognize those three names at all. Maybe it's from some of the music that I've written and recorded over the last 32 years now. Wow, can't even believe that. Hi, my name is Emily Chapman Richards, and I am the lucky, lucky eldest daughter of Mary Beth and Stephen Curtis Chapman here in Franklin, Tennessee. Um, I am currently serving as the executive director of Show Hope. A nonprofit organization that seeks to care for orphans by engaging the church and reducing barriers to adoption. It's co-founded by, by my parents in 2003, and um, I've been here for a decade working, which is, I love it. Um, but probably most importantly, I am the wife of Tanner Richards and the mother to three beautiful ladies, Eileen, Della, and Verity. And we live here in Franklin. I remember... You know, my earliest memories are of my dad kind of stopping in the middle of the the conflicts and the arguments that happened a lot in our home because there was so much shame and, and uh, you know, anger and confusion in, in my dad's heart. And uh, he would stop and say, you know what, we, we need to pray. And I remember we would just get on our knees as a family and dad would just talk to God like, like a friend. You know, he just would say, God, I don't know how to be a father. I don't know how to be a good husband. Please help me. Please show me how to do that. My dad had did not have a father in his life, and uh, sadly, his his dad left home when my dad was three. So that was a gaping hole. And in place of that, on top of it, was a lot of shame, uh, a lot of embarrassment um, from the from the you know little bit of relationship uh, that that was known, and it wasn't something we even really talked a lot about growing up. Except that I remember when my dad really began to walk with the Lord um, when I was uh, seven years old. And so I was marked, you know, as even as a little boy with the reality that, you know, the, the, the place that you're gonna ultimately, you know, know how to have a relationship with your children, even out of brokenness, there's gonna be brokenness, there's gonna be things that aren't as they should be, but a, a desperation, you know, for God to just give you that wisdom as our Heavenly Father. And so um, my dad, even with all that brokenness, um, he modeled for me. He was gone a lot. He was uh, had a music store, music business that his hours usually started right before I got home from school and went until after I was asleep. So I don't remember having a lot of my dad except on weekends. And um, and we, we did some fishing together and hunting together and things like that. I have some really great memories of that, but there wasn't a, a real, you know, it wasn't every night coming home at, in the door at five or six o'clock and having a lot of time with him. But I do remember the time that we had very uh, being intentional. I remember the notes probably came from my dad. He would leave notes for me and my brother often and, and uh, you know, say, you know, a prayer for us and things like that. But I remember you know, deeply saying, yeah, my dad's, even if he's not here in physical presence, I know that uh, I'm, you know, he's, I'm I'm in his heart and I'm on his mind. I'm in his prayers and and thoughts and he's got my back, you know, he's, he's with me. 
Oh my goodness. I love my dad. Dad has always continues to remain to this day, always very intentional with every moment he does have. I think it's evident even in his songwriting, he takes captive every word, every three minutes he has with an audience. That's exactly the same in how he has fathered uh, me and all of my siblings in that every kind of moment when he was home was, um, was really intentional to be present uh, with us. So I have, you know, I have memories of dad being on the road, but flying, you know, he'd take a red eye to, to come home and be at some basketball game where I'd, I don't even, I couldn't even make a basket, but he'd come home just to be present. I was a terrible athlete, but just to be present, I think another kind of rhythm that dad established early on as I've become a parent, <laughs> really kind of a new level of appreciation and just understanding the intent behind um, every time dad would leave for tour and like, not like at the beginning of the tour, but like every run, you know, he would write letters to each one of us and they sometimes longer, sometimes shorter and leave them on the counter. And it was just a real commitment, you know, a prayer for us, a Bible verse, a real commitment to like ha- take captive again, the intentionality, even in those moments and those words to, to show that he was caring for us and loving us well. Um, and so I consider it an incredible privilege to have been raised by him and my mom. And, and um, I just hope I can do half as good of a job. <laughs> Thank you, Emily, for that. I have to Say that for just for your words of blessing. I mean, there's nothing sweeter to the heart of a of a dad than to hear his children, you know, bless him. And yet, you know, I am, as we all are, painfully aware of you know of my uh, failures and you know failings and flaws and faults in those areas too. And you know, it feels like the jury is out until you know, until we stand before Jesus, which then thankfully it's all going to be grace and all of that. But it's like, I don't know if I did it. I don't know if I did it right. If I did it well, I see some moments where I did. I see some, a lot of moments where I didn't. Um, So God just pour a lot of grace over top of all of that, please. um, Because that's our only hope kind of the legacy work of our family to be um, about advocating for the rights of kiddos that don't have families started in 1997. A long time ago, uh, my mom and I, I was in fifth grade at the time, and my mom and I had the opportunity to travel to Haiti with Compassion International on a mission trip. We were sponsoring a child at the time through Compassion. We were able to spend some time with her. And, you know, I'm, I was 11 at the time. And so a lot of the children we were meeting um, that didn't have families that were orphans, they were similar age to me. And so in my little brain and my little heart, trying to start putting the pieces together of what life would look like without um, you know, knowing where my next meal was coming from or knowing where I was going home to or if I was going to be able to come to school the next day, you know, just all these questions that really broke my heart um, and my mom's. And we returned from that trip and I was determined that, uh, well, I, I, God was really doing something in my heart. And, um, but I was, I was determined when we came home that we should become missionaries. <laughs> so I tried to like 100% convince mom and dad, like we have got to move to Haiti. That is what we have to do. And dad and mom were gracious to be like, well, we, dad's career is like pretty United States centric. You know, we have some international travel, but it's his career is pretty much here. And, um, but I really got to give credit to my mom and dad and, um, they have always encouraged me to really press into what God may be speaking um, to my heart. And that was that was part of the fabric of how they brought us up even from a young age. And so on that trip to Haiti was a family who was in the adoption process. And so my tactics, cha- I changed my tactics. And, I, and, and so then I started campaigning and I was like, okay, fine. If we can't move to another country, could we consider inter-country adoption and bringing a child from another country home um, through adoption into our family? So eventually, um, God, in his own way, in his own timing, um, sort of uh, changed my parents' hearts to really be open and excited about the idea of intercountry adoption. And we started the process in 1999, I guess. So a couple years later to um, bring Showy home. So Showy came home from China in 2000, and then Stevie Joy in 2003, and Maria in 2004. At the time, I was very serious when I would kind of 
in a funny way, say we have three children that we've nicknamed Eeny, Meeny, and Miney, and we ain't having no mo. That was kind of the joke to say, we're done, you know, with three kids. That's it. But, you know, to just see how God was even using, you know, our daughter and, and that story that he was telling and, and uh, you know, did direct us, as she said, to, to ultimately adopt Shohanna, um, our first of what would become three daughters from China. But then from that, we, you know, God, again, as he directed our steps while we were in China, we got to visit Shoei's orphanage. We got to walk through the, the place where Shoei had spent the first seven months of her life, which was very rare when you look back even then. Not very many families got to do that. We saw it with our own eyes, hundreds of little ones, you know, in, in room after room that were waiting for their story to begin, waiting for a family to come say, you belong. And you fast forward, you know, three or four days after seeing that or a week after seeing that and having our hearts broken while we were so overwhelmed with the gift of our daughter, Shoei, we were also, you know, our hearts were broken with the reality of, you know, these, all these children, we now have our eyes open to the fact that, you know, these children represent millions of children all over the world waiting for their story to begin. And then, you know, immediately we are confronted with families who say, we would love to adopt someday. We want to bring one of those children into our family, but there's the cost. There's the, the barrier of, of that adoption is this hurdle that there's no way we can get over, you know, a, a cost of 20, 30, $40,000 to adopt a child. We thought surely there's an organization somewhere that's, you know, helping families and helping these children become a part of a family. We couldn't find that organization. And so that's really very simply how Show Hope began. We just began to say, what if we could help? Let's start telling this story. Let's start telling the story, not only for these children and give them a voice uh, for children that are all over the world waiting for, for a family, but there are families waiting for that child, wanting, longing to bring that child home. So we had a dream of helping a hundred families. That was a big, you know, wild dream of, Hey, what if we could help? We started with 10. We said, Maybe we could even do more if we tell the story and use the platform that God's given Mary Beth and me with my music and our story. And uh, we have been able to help almost 6,300 families now uh, bring children home from, what is it, 63 countries or something like that, Emily? Yeah. Amazing beyond anything we sure could have ever asked or imagined. In addition to their mission of bringing families and children together through adoption, music continues to be a part of the Chapman legacy. True to his Kentucky roots, Stephen just released a brand new album called Deeper Roots, Where the Bluegrass Grows, a nod to the music he grew up hearing and loving when he was a boy. The home that I grew up in, there was a lot of music and um, country folk music. My dad played music. My earliest memories really are of my, the sounds of folk and bluegrass music. My dad's best friend on one side was Scotty Henson, a five-string banjo picker. His other best friend, Jack Curtis Martin, where I get my middle name, Curtis, was a world-class go-bro player who would go on to play with Flat and Earl Scruggs on the Grand Ole Opry. Dad, I never never knew that's where your middle name was from. I didn't know that. Yeah, so that is, isn't that kind of crazy? Um, And, uh, you know, and so, and I grew up, you know, in in the, the, you know, where the bluegrass grows, you know, the Kentucky, the home of bluegrass, this is what I heard and what I grew up loving. And I've been talking so much about that over the last couple of years in concert. I think it got all those, uh, you know, those little sparks stirred up inside of me that I thought I want to do a recording that sort of honors that. And um, so it was really a, a special thing for me to go in and, and record an album that both honors the, you know, the music that I love so much that I think kind of was real formidable for me uh, as a as a little boy, um, gave me a love for you know just for the guitar and for the sound of you know voices blended in harmony and those sounds of mandolins and banjos and dobros and upright bass and all those you know sounds that are just kind of deepest in inside of me. Well, I think very much the way I have tried to craft the songs that I've written. One of my goals has been, you know, I think early on someone, actually I I read an early review of one of my uh, albums and and the reviewer said, 
you know, this is a kind of a new guy on the scene, but, you know, we feel like he's kind of a, uh, everyday, uh, kind of a common man's theologian. He takes, you know, scripture and truth and, and makes it something that, uh, you know, wherever we are, uh, it, it applies to, to just real life, right, right where we're living today. And I, I was so honored by that. And so probably compelled by that to, to really dig in deep to that, to try to, you know, take, cause I'm, I'm, I am very much, you know, a, a man of, of, uh, you know, in, shaped by great books that I've read, great authors, great writers. I've been mentored so much by, you know, so many that I'll never meet face to face who have mentored me through their writings. And, um, I'm so grateful for that. And, um, and yet the ones I've always gravitated towards have been those that, you know, I feel like, uh, I, I can really take it and apply it to right where I am, you know, at that, at that moment. And, uh, and, you know, that's, what's so beautiful about Jesus calling is I think it, it just, the, the, the approach of, you know, speaking in a language where you, you know, you, you feel like Jesus is speaking these things to you and, uh, and right in your situation, um, has been so impactful, obviously in the lives of so many, but certainly in, in my life as well. I would love to read this one from, from March 12th. And, uh, I think this is just something that, because it so resonates with our family, those that know our story, know that we lost our youngest daughter, uh, about 11 years ago. And, uh, and part of our journey has been learning to live with that, you know, kind of hole in our soul and that, that brokenness that we are going to carry through this life with us. And knowing that much of, you know, Jesus calling is even written from that place of suffering and yet how God meets us in that in such a profound way that we won't be able to experience him really any other way, which we don't like that. Sometimes we don't want that, but that's, that is true. And we experience God in the, you know, in, in that place. And I think that's why this one, particularly March 12th, it says waiting, trusting, and hoping are intrinsically connected like golden strands interwoven to form a strong chain. Trusting is the central strand because it is the response from my children that I desire the most. Waiting and hoping embellish the central strand and strengthen the chain that connects you to me. Waiting for me to work with your eyes on me is evidence that you really do trust me. If you mouth the words, I trust you, while anxiously trying to make things go your way, your words ring hollow. Hoping is future directed, connecting you to your inheritance in heaven. However, the benefits of hope fall fully on you in the present. Because you are mine, you don't just pass time in your waiting. You can wait expectantly in hopeful trust. Keep your antenna out to pick up even the faintest glimmer of my presence. So I think that just our, our family is so, you know, right now we are connected with those three words, waiting, trusting, and hoping, because that is our, that's our journey. We wait, we, we know, we trust that the story is not over. We, our hope is in God, knowing that, you know, our broken hearts are going to be made whole. And, uh, and we wait for that and we wait for it together. We lean into each other. And um, so that's a, that's a great encouragement to me, even, even today. Jesus calling for, for kiddos is, is, is where I'm at, is my world. And I've just so appreciated. Um, in fact, I was reading from it last night with my little girlies and they wanted to read um, the crucifixion and the resurrection stories and to be able to read um, what Sarah's written and just saying, hey, close your eyes and pretend that Jesus is saying this to you. It was neat to have that as a tool, as a mama, to help create conversation that I hope I hide in my heart and remember long, long, you know, long from now when they're grown up and on their own, um, that I was able to have these really sweet moments with them. So yeah, it's, it's incredible work. Yeah. Emily is an amazing mom and I know she is you know very aware of and this is part of the DNA of Emily that I love and pray for because she carries a lot of the same things that her mom and dad uh, unfortunately put into her of perfectionism and I'm not doing it right 
and I've really screwed this up and I could do this better and you know I need to do it better and you know it's part of parenting you don't realize that I'm gonna watch my own children you know struggle with you know their own parenting and and the you know the feelings of gosh I'm not doing it right I'm not doing it well enough and you wanna you wanna fix that for them and uh, and and then you see them just be amazing and do incredible things that you think you know God thank you that's that's you at work in them to learn more about Stephen's latest album Deeper Roots Where the Bluegrass Grows or about the organization Show Hope please visit stephencurtischapman.com. Stay with us as we talk with our next father and daughter team, Sawyer Brown frontman Mark Miller and TV host Madison Brown, after a brief message about a free offer from Jesus Calling. Are you looking for a way to keep track of your daily prayers along with Jesus Calling? The Jesus Calling Family Prayer Calendar goes right along with your daily readings from Jesus Calling. Each day begins with a guided reflection, followed by a space for you to fill in your prayers of thanksgiving and special requests. You can get your free Jesus Calling Family Prayer Calendar by visiting jesuscalling.com slash offers. Visit jesuscalling.com slash offers to download your free family prayer calendar today. Our next guests are country music performer and Christian music producer Mark Miller and his daughter Madison Brown. When Mark Miller and his country music band Sawyer Brown won their season of Star Search in the 1980s, they looked around at the Hollywood lifestyle and chose to live and perform a little differently from the rest. And sure enough, almost 40 years later, the band and their families are reaping the benefits of those decisions. Today, Mark and Madison talk about growing up on the road, how they've seen God work in ways they didn't expect, and how a family text thread about Jesus Calling keeps their ties stronger than ever. I'm Mark Miller, and I'm the lead singer in a band uh, called Sawyer Brown. We've been together for 37 years now. I have, am told uh, on Wikipedia that we have 51 chart records, we have 23 albums. Uh, I also uh, produce uh, the band Casting Crowns, uh, a Christian rock band. And uh, I am Madison and Gunner's dad and Lisa Miller's husband. <laughs> That's probably your best role. Yes. Um, I am Madison Brown. Uh, that is my married name, ironically enough. And I am the host of a travel TV show on RFD TV called Chasing Down Madison Brown, where I chase down the best food people and um, farms in the country. And it's based loosely on my growing up with this guy out on tour because he decided if he was going to have a family, us and the dog were all going to come along. That's right. I think the year that, that we brought the dog with us was really the year that we all grew quite close. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Madison had a, a golden retriever, and Abby was not a small golden retriever, <laughs> and she... Came out with us. <laughs> yeah. So. So, yeah, we literally packed up everything and put it on the bus like the Beverly Hillbillies. It was great. <laughs> I grew up in, in Florida and, uh, you know, just like every, most of the Floridian kids, I, you know, I surfed and I, I skied. Um, when I was 16, I, I got a job at Walt Disney World as a trick water skier. And so I did that all through college. But I grew up in church from the earliest memories that I have of any kind of anything musical. Spiritual was all, you know, based and centered around the church. It was a Pentecostal church, and I still consider myself Pentecostal. The way, you know, a lot of people talk about our music, and, and it has a lot of energy, but our, our music definitely had energy in the Pentecostal church. I mean, you know, we were, quote unquote, called the Holy Rollers. And, um, and I love that interpretation of of the Holy Spirit in music, you know, it's, it has a lot of energy, there's a lot of soul to it. And, and, and I think you can hear that in some of, you know, the, the, the stuff that I've done in, in Sawyer Brown. We got our start on a TV show called Star Search and I tell the kids that I was the original American Idol. Which I did not believe until the wonderful world of YouTube came about <laughs> and I found the original Star Search tapes. 
of him in the 80s winning Star Search. And I was like, oh my gosh, I think he's telling the truth. And I sent it to my little brother and he was like, he hasn't been lying all these years. <laughs> So Thank that, you, that you was too. that was kind of the jump start <laughs> of our career, and 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 you, you know you know how the media is. There was just this huge onslaught of you know you're just everywhere um, and popularity, and and you know that really really messes with your head. And and I, I will tell you that that my faith was the th the thing that that kept me level, and because. Um, there's so much stuff thrown at you. And I remember the very first meeting that I went into with the, the president of Capitol Records coming off of that show. And I, and I said, well, listen, you have to understand there's, you know, I'm a, I'm a Christian. There's certain things I won't sing about, especially when you, when you think of country music. You know, you think of drinking and, you know, cheating, cheating songs. songs and all that. And I, and I just said, listen, that's not who I am, and, and if if you expect me to to participate in those kind of songs, you've got the wrong guy. And I remember him just getting a big smile on his face, and he says, "You can do whatever you want." And 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 they stuck to that my my whole career. I was always allowed to produce our records. I was allowed to choose all of our songs. I wrote most of our songs, and they never wavered on that. And, you know, 37 years later, you know, I look back and, and that was the original stand that I, that I took. And it, it really just gave me co more confidence in my faith uh, at, at that point. And because there were several other things throughout my career that were just kind of crossroads that, that, that really challenged my faith. And I always went in the direction of my faith and it always was the right thing to do. Being a, a, a Christian man and a Christian family, my, my wife as well, you know, when we decided to have kids, I mean, I was, you know, on tour full time, probably doing 250 dates a year. Um, and I wanted the family out with me, you know, uh, e even though, you know, you know, quote unquote, you're a rock star, I didn't buy into the rock star lifestyle you know you know I, I bought into that was that's what I did for a living that was my business but I still believed in the family and in my faith and so they were out with me I had we had our own bus and um, they would go out you know all the time and you know there was always that family time and then we would pull in backstage with the bus and dad would get out and do his show, and most of the time they would not even come off the bus. They were watching TV or making dinner or whatever. But, um, and, and I think they grew up, hopefully that's just what dad did for a living. It wasn't any different than, a, you know, kids dads who were a fireman or whatever. It's just, that's how we got to work in the bus and dad went to work and he was back on the bus two hours later. And I just never, put it together that it was abnormal until I actually was like in school with other kids and realized, what do you mean you don't have a tour bus? <laughs> How do you get to the places? <laughs> and then this was really weird too. What do you mean your dad is like home every single day? Like I think that was a very bizarre, because I was like, well, your dad works and working means he goes, <laughs> he goes away <laughs> and comes back. And now I found out that there are these things called nine to fives. <laughs> um, so I think, it, but it was nice. I think that was the way that you guys wanted it that I, I found out because it was just so normal to us that that was actually abnormal. But then if you looked at like the nuts and bolts of a family unit and and all of that kind of stuff, my our life was way normal. Yeah, that was a conscious effort, <laughs> is to to make it as normal as possible, and. Um, and we were we were really strict on the kids. I mean, we were, you know, uh, I had I had been around a lot of the celebrities' kids, and and I thought, you know what, I don't ever want them to grow up and think that they're entitled. You know, I want them to grow up the the, the way that I did to know that you know if if you're willing to work, you can achieve anything you want to, uh, but you have to work to get it. There is not a lot of me time on a bus. 
um, which I think has contributed to our family being far too close. That's probably our problem. <laughs> we're not we're not too distant. We're too close together because yeah, there's only what forty five feet yeah. that you can go to escape someone. And I think you had to. I mean, you had to learn to get along in a very confined space for a very extended period of time. Yeah. But I think a lot of it was really good because you couldn't escape. So you had to learn to deal with each other. And the standard for what that behavior was going to be was pretty high. Um, you know, we were always taught like one of the greatest verses in the Bible was love your sibling. Yeah. And that was reiterated many a time on the bus. I'm pretty sure the first time I saw Sarah Young's Jesus Calling was when I was in high school at a summer camp out in Colorado. And I remember someone, I think it was one of the, the older camp counselors had this book and was just telling us it was such a great way to have a, like a daily devotion that we could all do really simply every day. They had the Bible verses pulled for you. Um, and that it was very practical and they were, it was really advocated for as a really practical way for high schoolers to be daily in the word. And it was broken down in a way that was, you know, God speaking to you, um, which I think really appealed to me personally at the time in high school. I was really looking for that type of, of relationship with um, God then. And so I, um, I can't remember if I was gifted the book or if I went out and bought it for myself, but then I remember my mom looking at it being like, this is perfect for your dad. There aren't a lot of words because he famously just... My attention span is about that long. So, <laughs> so it was this per is per this perfect. This is perfect. <laughs> Percy, yes. this is perfect for me. It really is a, a great inspiration for me to be able to read this because mm -hmm. I really have a short attention span. So, so this is like this is perfect. Mm -hmm. Like one page, I can I can really dial in and read it. And so it's it's if there are other guys out there like that, this is this is the book. And we all still read it all yeah. the time. And my mother has decided to integrate Jesus Calling and technology together by these lovely family group texts where all it will She'll be take a picture <laughs> of the, the picture page with some highlighted portions yeah and send it and you know it's just like you know when you're in in church or whatever and you hear the sermon the the pastor say something and you're thinking well so and so needs to hear that when in reality you're supposed to be hearing it too well when my wife reads this she like s reads stuff that i need she thinks I need to know, and my brother, or my, my son needs to or know, me. her brother, or her. And so sometimes <clears throat> she will not so subtly let us know <laughs> that Jesus calling today really pertains to you <laughs> and what's going on in your life. And you could use some of that today. <laughs> and, and I hope she doesn't see this, but she's usually right. We don't also, tell her that. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's kind of become not only a great way for all of us to to have a, a good daily devotional, but at the same time, um, you know, a, a great way to keep, stay together as family. And we also really like it because even if, like, as, you know, I've, I've read this book a lot, <laughs> cover to cover, but you always seem to pick up something new mm -hmm. um, every time, which is pretty great. Or in your case, you've just forgotten it. There's one that I know that, that I have always really loved um, is actually from, it's from May 1st, and it says, You are on the path of my choosing. There is no randomness about your life. Here and now comprise the coordinates of your daily life. Most people let their moments slip through their fingers half-lived. They avoid the present by worrying about the future or longing for a better time and place. They forget that they are creatures who are subject to the limitations of time and space. They forget their creator who walks with them only in the present. Every moment is alive with my glorious presence to those whose hearts are intimately connected with mine. As you give yourself more and more to a life of constant communion with me, you will find that you simply have no time for worry. Thus, you are free to let my spirit direct your steps, enabling you to walk along the path of peace. Um, and that one I particularly love because I think a lot about our life can seem quite random. And so just to know that, you know, this has always been a great reminder for me that there is 
we are on the path of God's choosing and that if we are in that constant communion and communication with him and that's where our focus is, you know, we're going to get to where we need to go because we're going to continue to be on the path that the Lord wants us on. God, you know, I think has a sense of humor and, and Mark Hall and I talk about that all the time. Mark Hall is the, the, the lead singer of Casting Crowns and they've, you know, gone on and become, you know, extremely successful in the Christian rock world. Um, but, you know, you've got a, a country artist that has a Christian label, uh, which is, is me, that produces this band. And, um, and Mark Hall at the time was a 34-year-old youth pastor with a wife and three kids. So, um, and everybody had kind of told him that he was way long in the tooth to get a record deal and, and all that. And then God just says, hey, I'm going to show you what I can do when I want to make a move and do something. And that's what he did. And, and everything that has happened with Casting Crowns has just been you know, such a, a, a display of, of God showing what he can do with the most unlikely situation. Uh, and that's been that, that's also been fun for me to not only to watch but have a front row seat to be to be a part of. So been been pretty blessed to wear a lot of hats and and th the only qualification that I've ever had is that that God opened that door. You can find where Sawyer Brown is playing a show near you at sawyerbrown.com. To watch Chasing Down Madison Brown on RFD TV, check your local listings. If you'd like to hear more stories about dads working to raise kids with faith, check out our interview with writer Bob Goff and his daughter, Lindsay Goff Vitasich. Next time on the Jesus Calling Podcast, we speak with evangelist, movie producer, and author T.D. Jakes. When we caught up with Pastor Jakes, he reminded us that it's important to have empathy for others, no matter what they seem to be portraying on the outside as those who may appear to be achieving great success in one area of their life may be experiencing devastation in another. I'm at that stage in my life now that I really want to leave footprints behind uh, about what it really costs uh, to be who you are and, and, and how to survive questions that people don't see because they see you only through the window of how they understand you to be. But life is much bigger the 30 minutes on television or an hour on television, life is much bigger than eight hours on a job. And sometimes we make assumptions yeah. about people we work with or live next door to or we see on TV that are not correct assumptions about what their whole life is like. Do you love hearing these stories of faith weekly from people like you whose lives have been changed by a closer walk with God? then be sure to subscribe to the Jesus Calling Stories of Faith podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. If you like what you're hearing, leave us a review so that we can reach others with these inspirational stories. And you can also see these interviews on video as part of our original web series, with a new interview premiering every other Sunday on Facebook Live. Find previously broadcast interviews on our YouTube channel, on IGTV, or on JesusCalling.com slash video.